Um, good afternoon from Hong Kong. Um, hi everyone. My name is Amanda. I hope everyone is staying safe and healthy. Um, I'm the founding board member of uh, FTH FTA HK and also the board sponsor of its Intratech committee. Uh, my day job is with John Ond uh, to look after the partnership for its uh, virtual banking and virtual insurance business in Hong Kong. Today is actually my pleasure to moderate the panel on a topic called digital digitalization of insurance industry. How can technology help in uh, revamping the user experience? Uh, we are you know, very lucky to have representatives from Hong Kong, Singapore, and India today to join us. So uh, without further ado, I guess um, I'll just kick off our panel by inviting our speakers to quickly introduce themselves uh, by telling us, um, you know, um, how your company is actually playing a part with the digitalization journey um, on today's topic. Um, I have a biased heart with Hong Kong, so um, I would just um, invite Kane to, you know, probably kick off first. Uh, Kane, uh, please go ahead. Okay, thank you, Amanda. Hello, everyone. My name is Kane Leong, head of FinTech at Invest Hong Kong. Uh, it's a great pleasure to talk to you. Now, basically, the, uh, as a government department, we are responsible to foster the, uh, the growth of the uh, fintech sector. And by that, uh, this everything from uh, inviting you know, uh, you know, energetic uh, fintech companies from all around the world to settle in Hong Kong, to working with the regulators to solve some issues based on feedback we get from the community uh, by inviting investors to get them more uh, educated about the uh, fintech landscape for investment purpose. So essentially, a lot of the issues uh, that need to be solved Typically, uh, we are aware of them initially, and then we basically bring along uh, different stakeholders to help us solve those problems. In the end, the goal is to make the business environment a, a very vibrant and also a constructive environment uh, for the companies to grow. Uh, so this is our role, and this is a great opportunity today uh, to speak with so many great speakers, and I'm happy to, to share more in our webinar. Sure. Um, can I um, invite Alvin to, you know, share about um, your pet, uh, you know, insurance maybe and how, how you guys have run through as a third uh, license of uh, the virtual insurance in Hong Kong? Yeah. Uh, thanks, Amanda, for the introduction. My name is Alvin Kwok. I'm the uh, co-founder and CEO of One Degree. Uh, one Degree has two business. Uh, one business is uh, uh, we got uh, one of the four virtual insurer licenses in Hong Kong uh, back in April. And like what Amanda said, we launched PAT insurance within a week. Uh, and uh, in fact, since April, uh, we have two major revamps to improve the user experience in two months' time. Uh, and you know, I think you know, that, that we can share a bit more about that because today's um, topic is about user experience. Uh, we also are launching two other products in August uh, for e-commerce companies. Uh, so that's one part as a virtual insurer. The second part of one degree is that uh, we are also a technology provider as well. Uh, in fact, in July, we launched the IST core insurance operating system. Uh, so that one is a software as a service model, modular based, no code. So for one degree, uh, insurance companies and insure tech startup to me, as friends and not enemies. And we would like to bring up the industry together in getting the user experience substantially better. So, uh, and we'd love to have more exchange on that later on. Thank you. Cool. Um, so now I would like to pass on to Fred, our um, section sponsor. So I know you guys have done a lot in uh, EKYC, which is you know, very important to the user experience. So maybe you can just tell us a bit more. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, to uh, listening on to the webinar today and uh, to the panelists. Uh, my name is Frederick, and I'm the Vice President for Jumio in the APEC region. Uh, so who, who is Jumio? Uh, we, we are an EKYC service provider. We have been in this business for 10 years, having completed uh, over 250 million online identities verified. So um, th this gives us uh, 10 years of experience, 10 years of data, to tune and provide uh, the level of accuracy that we deliver on this work. So um, our, our vision for customers really is that the digital economies represents the, the new frontier. So clients that we support looks to uh, a global audience, different markets that are cross border. And, and within this unified service that we deliver, verifying over uh, identity documents from 200 countries and 3,500 ID types, 
uh, it, it takes away the uh, barriers from, from uh, going into new markets and looking at how the business ought to be performing in the digital world. Uh, and of course, uh, to do this, we have to provide the level of security that is safe enough that regulators can agree that this model will work within each market. So uh, I think today's session will be exciting. Hope to share a bit, a bit more about what we have done in this, uh, in this space, especially where we can look to, to provide this uh, to the insurance industry as well. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, okay, so next I would like to pass on to uh, Kayvon. Um, so you guys are based in Singapore, but also look after, uh, you know, a lot of InsurTech in the region. So tell us a bit more about uh, your team and yourself. Sure. Thanks, Amanda, and for the invitation to speak here. Uh, my name is Kayvon. I'm the Director for FinTech and InsurTech uh, for Plug and Play based here in Singapore. Uh, we're a Silicon Valley based company. That's where our origin is. Uh, that's where I used to work, if you can't tell from the accent, uh, before I moved to Singapore about two years ago. So globally, we are a early stage venture capital firm. We're one of the most active in the world, uh, investing in pre-series A startups primarily uh, in a variety of industries. So plug and play is across uh, 18 different industries, uh, our, our biggest of which is financial services, uh, both in Silicon Valley and globally. And so uh, what we do is we're a VC in early stage startups, but we also do corporate innovation. So we work with um, large insurance companies like reinsurance companies, primary insurers, both life and non-life, uh, as well as brokers or anyone that pretty much uh, is a major stakeholder in the insurance industry looking to digitalize or innovate uh, and we're their external innovation partner. So looking to connect them with startups globally uh, and perhaps uh, doing some culture change and design thinking uh, initiatives internally. So really trying to become a one-stop shop for innovation, both for uh, corporates as well as startups. Uh, and then we're based in Singapore, servicing Southeast Asia, uh, ANZ, and India. It's uh, very interesting to, you know, when you mentioned about culture change, I think we will come back with this later on. Um, sure. So last but not least, um, I would like to invite our rep representative from um, India. So Achirang, you know, stage is yours. Hi, Amanda. Hi Amanda, thank you everyone. Hi everyone. Uh, hello from India. Uh, I must say that it is uh, not the best of times in India. We are going through unprecedented times as far as COVID-19 is concerned and the, where I am right now in India, there's a red alert for a flood happening right now. So infrastructure is all over the, all over the, all over the scene, if you will. Um, so um, I'm probably going to be in and out of video, uh, given the way the electricity is working right here. So sorry about that. Um, so I'm one of the four co-founders of Discovery. Discovery is a two and a half year old startup based out of uh, Mumbai and Bangalore. Um, we are an insurance in a box, uh, which is a combination. Of, it's an insurance as a service, if you will, uh, a combination of three fundamental foundational blocks that constitute insurance in a box. One is the insurance product itself, which for us is nothing but a set of API keys that cuts across products, cuts across insurance companies uh, in India. Um, Second is the backend SaaS, uh, all the all the technology that you need to manage end-to-end -end digitization of your insurance uh, distribution business across channels, across carriers, uh, all seamlessly brought uh, brought into one particular uh, white-labeled SaaS offering. And third is we are a, a licensed intermediary here as well in India, which allows us to uh, work with our distribution partners to uh, you know enable uh, compliance overheads that they don't have to get through themselves, which we can offer as a service. So to all three of all three of that together constitute uh, insurance in a box. We are agnostic of uh, distribution channels as well. Uh, we work with mainstream insurance distribution uh, uh, partners as well as alternative distribution partners. Uh, happy to go deeper into that. Okay, I think we are losing. Okay, we are, we are good, right? Okay, so uh, thank you, you know, everyone for your brief introductions. Uh, before we go to individual questions, um, I would like to actually invite and remind uh, all our participants that we have a Q&A uh, section at the bottom. So if you have any questions that you would like to raise to our panelists, uh, just feel free to type your questions there. We would um, address that as much as we can. Okay, um, so, um, you know, I probably would like to start with uh, Kane, um, you know, with your role in Invest Hong Kong and your very experience in the InsurTech um, 
industry. So, um, you know, what factors do you think that, you know, is the key to facilitate a change in, in the uh, insurance industry? Because obviously, I mean, I personally, I think, you know, when you look at the compare uh, insurance versus banking, the digitalization journey has been, you know, quite uh, moderate for the insurance um, industry so far. So what do you see, you know, would be a uh, plus or, you know, a point for us to drive these changes? Or is that something that, you know, as the regulators or, you know, uh, the end users that are actually dragging behind um, so that uh, you know, we can't, it's, it's a hurdle for us to push the change. And also, you know, what the difference between you see in the Hong Kong market versus others in the region? <clears throat> okay, uh, thank you, Amanda. Now, um, I'm, uh, I'm not an expert in uh, astronomy, but I have to say it has to have multiple factors, it's almost like all the stars align to get the uh, digitization and insurance to work. Because obviously, I think we have other experts uh, on the panel who have been doing, doing insurance for a long time. And I would think that for those of you who uh, know about the Hong Kong market, we we'll agree that now, first of all, insure tech has been around for some time. It's not new. So in China, so parts of Europe, you now UK, the number of countries that are doing quite well for a number of years already. It's, it's also not that the, the executives at the insurance companies are not aware of them. Because obviously, internally at the large insurance companies, they have the innovation team. They would know what's happening in other parts of the world. So they are fully aware of this. But it's just that, particularly the Hong Kong market situation, Again, Hong Kong is a very, is a highly profitable insurance market. And uh, by and large, because there have been a massive amount of uh, money and people from mainland China coming to Hong Kong to buy insurance policies. So, I mean, it's almost like, you know, making money hand over fist for a lot of insurance players. But interestingly, a lot of folks, a lot of insurance folks who have been making lots of money in the, in the past, let's you know, say five, five, eight years, is that, that they predominantly rely on the uh, agency force channels. So they have a pretty sizable agency force and um, super powerful. I think even the, the CEOs sometimes will have to be uh, very soft, sensitive about things that they're pushing to make sure that they're not rubbing the, weather, the, the feathers of the, uh, of the agency heads. So be because of that dynamics, a lot of times when we think about the introduction of insure tech, lots of often times it's being interpreted, right, rightfully so or not, that is going to be some sort of disintermediation. And when you have this kind of uh, technology being introduced, then the agency falls got a bit nervous. And as a result, they pressure, I think, the management team. And then most of the time, uh, the project that would not go very far. Now, and why I say that this, this, this year is, is the sort of like unusual year where all the stars align. It's just that on the one hand, we have pandemic in which I think the silver lining is that uh, you are forced to do digitization. Now, secondly, the, the insurance regulator in Hong Kong, uh, it's called Insurance Authority, uh, actually uh, was set up literally two, three years ago. People prior to that, it has a different name. So again, it was relatively new. So that's why it's a bit difficult for them to push through a lot of initiatives, simply because of the manpower. But then they've been able to get this lift, this, this with the pandemic, there's a consensus in the market to get something done, ASAP. So almost for the first time in recent years, you know, the, the corporates, you know, the, the, the agency force, you know, consumers, the regulators have this consensus to move this agenda forward. So in a way, I think this is a pretty uh, so unexpected, but uh, uh, nonetheless a positive development. Now, in terms of Hong Kong versus the rest of uh, uh, Asia, I would say that, uh, again, Asia is just very heterogeneous. I, I cannot say that uh, I know all of them, because obviously Japan, you know, versus like China, versus Indonesia, Singapore, they are all quite different. But one thing I would, I would, I would say that is quite uh, consistent is that uh, as the saying goes, insurance, you know, insurance, at least in the past, is never bought, it's always sold, right? So as a result, now if we have I think the, the, the newer customer experience that allowed us to sell insurance products in a way that the consumers can embrace it better. I think, I think that would be a, a big, a big uh, uh, catalyst for, for that uh, to, to get traction in certain markets. So that's why I think for places like China, obviously uh, insurance had a pretty bad uh, rap before, 
but then again, with the sort of the new way of customer experience, again, I think the traction from what we have seen for the sort of lower end small ticket items has been uh, setting reasonably well. Now, so with that, I, I would want to be constant of the time. So perhaps I should pause for a moment and uh, so defer to the other experts to share with the rest of the group. So, okay, thank you, Amanda. Yeah, I definitely hear you about the power of agency. I'm not sure whether, you know, uh, Elvin, that, you know, probably you, do you have anything that you would like to address as one of the players in the industry in Hong Kong? Yeah, well, well there's a great topic that insurance is, uh, is, is sold, it's not bought, right? So, uh, so indeed, I think there, there, well, there are a couple of comments that I have on this one. Uh, one is that uh, we do see a lot of customer outreach to us. Uh, after uh, we launched the pet insurance, in fact, we got tens of thousands of people who come over to us and ask us about the product. But having said that, the really interesting part is that the most common question that they ask is, PM me, please. Okay, so uh, PM means private message me, please. Okay, so the, the thing about it is that, you know, customers are really uh, used to getting surfaced, customer service on that, or, or sometimes even outreach and all that. Uh, but so what we do is we track the data and we track like when is the first time they come in uh, to what journey and so on. But the interesting part is once they really, once you really get them to try the purchase flow, try the claim flow and so on, uh, then everything is autopilot. They don't really come back and ask questions. So I think on that, it's really about how good the customer user experience is about. I think that's, that's the first point that I want to make. The second point I want to make is that, you know, before we launch the product, no matter how much user research that we have done, how much user survey that we have done, but those are not real customers. Those are fake customers, okay? Those are the target customer, but those are not uh, the, the real opinion, what they have in mind, uh, because they haven't really seen the product, they haven't gone through the, the flow. Well, even, even if there's some test cases, but it's still very limited. But once you get to more than 10,000 type of uh, user feedback, what you really find out is that there's a lot of changes that you need to make uh, on the product to really uh, uh, improve the conversion rate, how to make it work, how to find the product market fit and, and all that. So what it requires on that is that you need to have a, a technology, have the a system uh, that is really nimble for you to make changes. It will be drag and drop, okay? So adding this element, taking out this element and having different experiments and so on. So I think this is something that, that well, so if you really, if well, it, it, well th that's what we told the team. Uh, if you really think that you just put the product on the shelf and let it fly, that is not gonna happen. So it does take a lot of iteration and technology plays a big role in, in enabling that user experience. Uh, thanks, Evan. Um, I think we'll come back on this, uh, but I wanted to invite uh, Kayvon to help us to probably zoom out, you know, from Hong Kong, because uh, you mentioned that you work with, um, you know, early startups from a VC perspective on, um, you know, uh, the insure tech um, industry. So can you tell us a bit more, you know, whether you have observed any trend changes because of the COVID thing, um, you know, maybe this is an opportunity for industry tech to actually shine on. So uh, tell, tell us a bit more about that, please. Of course. So I think that COVID, I mean, as, as many people are aware, kind of accelerated this whole digitalization process. Um, I think in the past, when we've been working with insurance companies, there was a bit more of an experimentation view to it, maybe a little bit less urgency. I think people were looking very far ahead in the future, looking at, let's say, blockchain applications and insurance, or I mean, even like using AI for predictive analytics, which some insurance companies are using, using quite well, but some, it was quite new to them in terms of how to leverage their data. Um, and they were looking at things that are more, more future-based in, in terms of, instead of like core system digitalization, like Alvin was mentioning, or uh, and, and things of that nature. So I think the main shift that we're seeing is that a lot of insurance companies are handling, hand, uh, handling lower hanging fruit right now, um, looking very much to the current business challenges as opposed to the future, which in a sense is, is, is not a bad thing for startups because the ones that are adequately handling those uh, and can help insurance companies digitalize in the near term future. If you think about like, let's say OCR companies that can digitalize paper-based uh, systems or companies that can help uh, with, with digital distribution or digital marketing, which we think are emerging trends, uh, those, those startups are, good, are, are going to do quite well, even in the current business climate, because they're tackling tangible 
business cases that are quite urgent right now. So even though we're taking a step out from Hong Kong, I think one of this, we're still seeing a lot of technologies that are like CRM based or using, uh, using technology to enhance uh, Salesforce or agency uh, efficiency, uh, help make their jobs easier during this time so that businesses aren't losing a lot of business opportunity and money and, and, and near term revenue. I think looking forward, uh, another trend that we're seeing is leveraging, uh, let's say different platforms or, or distribution platforms like e-commerce uh, is, a, is a very big one that's especially been emerging now uh, in terms of increased e-commerce usage over the past few months, uh, as well as let's say SME. So typing, tapping into uh, maybe some lending platforms, peer-to-peer -peer lending platforms to see if they could uh, distribute insurance on there. So I think the, the trend we saw in banking was how does banking become kind of invisible in the background. And I think insurance companies would like to do that in the future. Um, one trend that I'm quite interested and passionate about that we're seeing in insurance is the overlap with health insurance and, and the health industry in particular. So whether we're talking about like remote patient monitoring, whether we're talking about telemedicine uh, and how do insurance companies partner not only with startups, but um, incumbent hospitals or, or pharmaceutical companies. That's a, that's a space of plug and play is gonna be focusing on a lot in the future. Uh, there are certain segments that are really interesting, like mental health. So um, a few months ago, AXA published uh, a press release that they're working with Naluri in the Singapore market. So I think we're going to be seeing more things uh, in the, the mental wellness, mental health, stress, uh, sleep is a big, uh, interesting issue. So I think uh, digital health and wellness is another trend that we're, we're looking at as well. Um, from an investment perspective, I, we, we, we haven't made as many investments as we, as we normally would make. Uh, but we're really interested in enablers. So startups that can help with, let's say, open API platforms or, or helping with, with, with payments, uh, things that can kind of facilitate insurance companies to do business. Um, I, can, I can stop there. Um, I think it's interesting that also you mentioned about the health industry because um, I think, you know, obviously COVID-19 is giving us uh, all, you know, stress on this um, and then, um, you know, Obviously, it's uh, giving a chance to the uh, health industry to think about how they can actually move into the digitalization as well. Um, you know, when we talk about the whole, you know, like e-journey, I think one of the pieces that we can't miss is the EKYC, right? So, uh, you know, from um, a regulated point of view, uh, cybersecurity might be a concern from a consumer uh, point of view, there's privacy, are the actually you know, like hurdles for me to, you know, whether I would like to trust an agent, a physical one, you know, like a, a person or, you know, am I okay to do it in the digital world? Um, so I would like to, you know, probably uh, pass it to, you know, Fred to tell us a bit more about, you know, how you guys actually overcome the, you know, cybersecurity or the privacy concern from your customers, uh, you know, actually convert them because you mentioned that you guys actually cater 200 countries plus, right? So um, can you tell us a bit how this actually can help to provide a better customer service to, to your users? Thanks, Amanda, uh, for giving the opportunity to me for, to answer this question. I'm very conscious that I'm uh, sitting virtually amongst insurance experts. So I'll, I'll just stick to the topic of what I know best. <laughs> uh, I, I think like, like all the panelists mentioned, uh, insurance business is pretty much face to face. You know, for the longest time, it is a sell mode, sell to mode, and that uh, the whole industry has been built on, on that approach. Uh, two things changed. Uh, one in the earlier couple of years uh, where we saw uh, digitalization of services and there will be exploration of putting products and services on a self-help model, right, uh, on web or mobile. And uh, in the last six months, things got even a lot more tougher, right, when face-to-face uh, -face was ba barely possible. And, and how long this will continue will will be a big question that uh, you know we have to think about but business can't stop we, we have got to find new ways to enable the business to con continue and the whole concept then that uh, what what parts of the whole insurance business was the identity proofing element really important that without that you know the the, the, the there will there will be uh, major disruptions uh, you know to, to the process to the flow so I, I think that this is where uh, Jumio brings in um, uh, an approach that was applied into fintechs, you know, into virtual banks, 
uh, into telecom, uh, telecom uh, industries where uh, business can be constructed, transacted and, and, and closed uh, without the company providing the service ever seeing the end user. Right, uh, that uh, with, with a certain steps and processes in place uh, that uh, presented to the regulators and that they, they, are, they are comfortable that this will not be a big issue in terms of uh, dealing with uh, anti-money laundering or CTF kind of environments, right, uh, that this could be applied. And, and Hong Kong is one of the leaders in this space, right, with uh, Hong Kong MA, you know, uh, since a couple of years ago, announcing already the plans for the virtual banks. And today we already see, of course, the services uh, in the market today. So, so I think that the, the gap then is uh, uh, plugged into uh, the, the service providers around EKYC, that it could fulfill certain processes within insurance that you, you need to be sure that the person that you are contracting is really who they say they are. You could have your insurance agent do a Zoom call with a prospect. At some point, you, you need to know that who are you opening the policy to. And for and did this person really uh, uh, consent to the policy purchase, right? And at some point, it, it's uh, whether if you want to put your products on a website uh, and someone uh, purchase a, a, a product, then of course they, they may need to fulfill that subscription uh, uh, registration of all the data that's being required. So these things has to be done, but it has to be done in a way that. Uh, we don't further irritate the user that already has to, uh, you know, fill in 10 pages of documents, declaring hundreds of stuff, right? So you want to make it as transparent as possible. And I think that that's where this user experience element comes in. We want, we want the user to submit something. Uh, we don't want to ask him to have to retry many times uh, because they will really pain you if that uh, a good client drops off after a few attempts because he couldn't complete some kind of identity proofing step. That, that would be really crazy, right? Um, but the, 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 the challenge in the other space would be that uh, there's a lot of online identity fraud ex ac activities going on. Um, and I think that where, where Jumio is different is having been in this business for 10 years, uh, executing these kind of identity verification work from, from one market to another, from APEC in North America and in the European markets, seeing the trends uh, of how online identity fraud could, could really affect business and, and applying the kind of a security cover to ensure that these things don't happen. Using biometrics, uh, liveness detection, verifying the authenticity of an ID document, and doing this not just for a single market, but really covering a, a, a global space. 200 countries, 3,500 where your business goes and you want to sign that user, user from Vietnam, from Thailand, from the Philippines, from Macau, that vendor should be able to already deliver this part of this identity verification work for you. Right? So I, I think that um, in, in combination, uh, selecting a, a, a strategy to, um, for, for the insurance industry is, is really quite vital. Uh, I, I see uh, um, our clients uh, in Singapore, in Malaysia. Now, regulators may relax the conditions for identity proofing. So they say that you can mail in your ID documents and accept it. But there's always a time limit before they will up, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the, the requirements again uh, for standards to be complied with. So I, I think that like, uh, like King, really now the stars are aligned. You know, the conditions really uh, puts uh, all the pieces together where uh, building up a strong digital strategy would make you a market leader in a digital insurance space. So I think that uh, uh, there's a lot that we can share about and to discuss. Uh, I'll be happy to take any questions uh, subsequent to this. Thanks, Amanda. Sure. Uh, thanks, Fred. Um, so, um, you know, um, this question probably is more to Fred and King. Um, how do you guys see if there is, or do you actually observe a relaxation um, of attitude from regulators? Or I shouldn't use the word relaxation. It should be, you know, a more open mind uh, from regulators in terms of getting the, you know, like digitization journey uh, in terms of the EKYC or AML process to actually help the industry to move forward, especially with the COVID-19 uh, kind of situation. Uh, Fred or Kate, <clears throat> anyone? 
Well, uh, maybe I go first. Yeah, sure. Um, now first, okay. Uh, first of all, the insurance authority. Uh, you see, I think they started out with the temporary or interim measure of uh, allowing this kind of digitized, you know, remote uh, selling via recorded uh, conversations between agents and customers. With the pre previous deadline was uh, end of June. But then uh, it was uh, subsequently postponed to end of September, to my recollection. So again, from talking to our colleagues at the uh, insurance authority, they are monitoring the traction in the market very actively. And again, I, I can't speak for our, for our peers uh, at the uh, insurance authority, but based on, I think, the positive feedback from uh, both the large insurance companies, uh, which have already got all this technology in place, to the medium size. Uh, insurance companies in which they're getting help from the local uh, association, the Hong Federation of Insurers. So in a way, I think people are magically become a much more, um, I would say, an embracing of this uh, sort of digitized way of doing business. So as a result, based on that market needs, uh, I, I can see that, uh, again, the IA are very, uh, I would say, they're reasonably open-minded while protecting the consumer's interest, but then they also recognize the market needs. So, so I, I can see that as the industry traction gets or sustained this way, I think the regulators would be able to, uh, I think, to help out by so going with the flow, if you will. Yeah. So, 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 Fred, yeah. Yeah, I, I think that uh, I totally agree with uh, King's comment that uh, this is a time where regulators are quite sensitive that uh, things are still changing and, and uh, how, how, how standards can still be maintained. But you, you can't really just uh, uh, put the same lid on the current situation because it won't work. Uh, I, I, there are, of course, uh, 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 markets in, uh, in APEC uh, where uh, in, the, in the past, of course, a, a lot of the, uh, the proofing of the individual uh, user is done by the insurance agent. And you, you, you sell the contract, you have very Find the documents you did a face to face, uh, and of course uh, today that this does not practical. I mean, given that we have got social distancing and most of us are you know locked down at home, right? But insurance business can't stop, right? So I think that the the requirement then that to allow or relax conditions to have mail in documentation, uh, even around identity proofing, right, uh, was relaxed to a certain extent that it can be remediated later. But at, at least uh, this will be will allow us certain processes to, to complete. So so I, I I agree that these are things are changing very dynamically. So the, when technologies can apply now, can in fact give the opposite uh, uh, assurance to uh, regulators that yes, maybe what we have been applying into fintech, into banking, right, is timely. That this can also be applied to insurance now. Um, anything that you would like to um, add on, Kevin, from you know a BC perspective that you are seeing, you know the region, you know from a from a early startup, you know perspective as well. Anything that you would like to you know touch on about the um, openness of you know regulators? So I would say I'm probably not the most qualified panelist to speak on the regulator issue. We don't we work quite closely with the MAS for certain initiatives they're doing, but uh, from a regulatory standpoint, we aren't too engaged. I would say we, we kind of defer to our, our core partners when it comes to, under, like, so we work with like regional companies like MSIG and Tokyo Marine, we might be working with companies located in a specific country like, like Astra in Indonesia or Cathay Financial in Taiwan. And we're not regulatory experts in all of these countries, right? Um, but what we do do is we leverage their expertise on the local market and they kind of let us know what might be the, the, the technologies they're looking for that would be suitable for their own individual unique regulatory landscape. I think that's where we come in and we understand what those uh, kind of concerns or limitations might be and then that would be part of the process of us finding the right partner for them to work with. Um, but we don't, I think from our, if we're looking at a specific startup depending on where they're located, then we'll dive into the regulatory issue there, but it's on a case-by-case -case basis. Right. Um, so um, I would like to actually move to uh, Shiran. Um, you know, you mentioned about your team uh, has been working on a few pillars, um, and I look at, you know, the marketing materials of you guys that you are uh, working with Bank as a digital insurance partner. So uh, it would be interesting to hear about 
from you what's going on in India, um, especially with the COVID and the flood ongoing. Um, you know, how do you see, um, you know, the digitalization is helping the population there to, you know, change uh, or to, you know, provide a better coverage to the populations? Or do you see act actually there is any difference of behavior in India versus um, other part of, of the world? Yeah, great question. So uh, why don't I start off by answering the, the India insurance story first and then sort of, you know, probably going a little deeper into, um, you know, how that is playing out on the consumer, on the UI, UX or the CX front, and then sort of what's really happening with us as far as discovery is concerned. What are we doing uh, about it, right? So um, so first things first, uh, so the, for the global audience who is here, just to kind of give a little bit of picture of what India's insurance story is all about. Uh, so India is a very interesting, probably one of the most exciting, uh, you know, growth markets as far as insurance is concerned, right? We are literally 2% of the global GWP. Uh, that is, so in terms of market size, we're literally 2% for being the second most populous country in the world, right? Uh, we are, insurance is 50% of the global median in penetration rate globally, right? So, uh, and this is not even considering only developed markets or underdeveloped markets across the world. We are pretty much, you know, 50% of the global insurance penetration rate, uh, but we are growing at 5x the CAGR, right? So when you put all of these together, uh, you, it, it, you know, it, it's a very interesting dynamic market, very young market. Um, a lot of our uh, sort of, you know, uh, tech stacks and insurance companies have been sort of come out over the last two to three decades at most relatively new tech stacks relative to the rest of the world. Uh, a, a lot of our, uh, you know, capabilities that you need as far as market access is concerned, growth is concerned, have been consolidated into market um, sort of, you know, public infrastructure uh, goods. Uh, you have heard of Aadhaar on the biometric side. You've probably heard of UPI on the payment side. All these constitute, you know, unique tech stacks that we can leverage as startups or as corporates or as insurers to kind of penetrate and, and start, start doing things that uh, we care about, which is close to our chest uh, for our own consumer basis, right? So, and leave the, the rest of the stuff, which is a little more horizontal in nature to these uh, public infrastructure goods, which is a phenomenal innovation for a country of our size. Um, so that is on the sort of on the, on the, on the top down side, if you will, right? If you look at the bottom up side of what's happening on the ground with COVID, uh, that is, uh, it's, a, it's a very, you know, very interesting sort of a space uh, we, we recently did some analysis in terms of what is the COVID impact on the Indian insurance industry. So the industry contracted about 4.5% in this past quarter relative to the, the same quarter of the prior year. Uh, you know, for the first time ever, health insurance in India overtook motor insurance. So motor insurance is a mandated product in India as against health insurance, right? So, um, and these are very interesting kind of uh, developments that are happening right now. And the industry is already bouncing back. You know, June 2020 was was probably one of our better months uh, in relative periods, right? So, um, at the same time, if you look at how insurance is essentially say sold, right? You either or or bought for that matter. Let's let's see it from a consumer's lens. You go and you either buy insurance yourself. Insurance gets sold to you via with an assisted model. Uh, you know, uh, and then third is insurance gets bundled or attached on the back of some other purchase, right? So you get a home insurance on the back of a home loan, you get a device insurance on the back of a device purchase, so on and so forth. So fundamentally, these are three distribution channels of insurance. And what we are seeing in India is the assisted uh, side, which is the physical interaction side has taken a nose dive. But tele side has, you know, really sort of, you know, more than made up for those kind of lost volumes. So we are seeing an omni channel distribution play in India, which is, uh, which is very exciting um, and uh, things are happening across the board. Um, so we think that, you know, I have a little counter view to the rest of my colleagues and peers on this particular uh, panel um, and, uh, you know, who have greater depth and experience. Uh, but uh, we are in a spot in India where we think we can reimagine insurance, right? Just because the way it has been done in the last 20 years doesn't mean the next 20 years are going to look exactly the same. So we think that insurance should be as simple as uh, digital payments so for a merchant to accept uh, digital payments you don't go and you don't go and code your own um, you know payment gateway you go and you, you go and sort of uh, partner up with one right similarly for insurance distribution so uh, we think as a discovery we if you are an existing business uh, and you want to add insurance distribution as a financial services layer uh, we are your one stop shop right with a combination of you know the tech as well as the license play 
to help you not only to penetrate and get into internal distribution but to scale across products across categories uh, as your business scales as well so that is the value proposition that we provide as discovery uh, and to talk specifically amanda about your question in terms of banks we right now we uh, we are a two and a half year old startup but we work across more than 10 different partner segments uh, from banks uh, nbfcs uh, you know payment gateways payment uh, networks um, wealth brokerage arm uh, then ad tech uh, supply chain tech farm tech agri tech so essentially we are that digital insurance layer for any insurance any business that wants to add insurance distribution and we are trying to make it as simple as possible so as far as our uh, you know couple of cases uh, use cases is concerned so re recently we launched um, so one of our customers is one of uh, asia's largest ad tech companies with more than 100 million dau they wanted to uh, they have uh, an app that comes uh, you know uh, embedded as part of uh, 70% of all android phones and they have a content app which surfaces content within that particular uh, lock screen right so they wanted to uh, you know bring insurance distribution and insurance purchase at the point of someone looking at their mobile phone's lock screen so i don't know of any precedents where any financial service is sold by 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 a user just looking at their uh, where the purchase journey starts by a user looking at their lock screen of the mobile phone let alone insurance but we did this in a matter of about four weeks so that is where sort of we are kind of leapfrogging as a country as a sector here in india where these new unique user experiences new consumer experiences are coming to the table where uh, different kinds of distribution uh, sort of entities can be mobilized to help kind of democratize the insurance distribution right so we think uh, that is the that is our vision to make it as simple as payments and uh, happy to share that you know so, some of these things seem to be working early days but uh, exciting days nevertheless interesting Thank um you, interesting. Yeah. also always a very interesting market i'm sure there is a lot of potentials out going there so um i would like to actually you know zooming back to hong kong uh, to um you know pet insurance so uh, we talked about that earlier on um, you know and I noticed that um, the pet insurance offers actually co uh, covers COVID-19 as well um, so maybe you know like uh, Alvin can tell us a bit more about you know how technologies is actually helping you to shape the uh, product uh, in terms of you know like developments and user experience and also you know how these actually specifically help to shape the flexibility of your offer um, to to meet the you know like uh, you know like sort of uncertainties in the market as well. Yeah, thanks, Amanda. That's a great question on on, on this. Well, in fact, we have been in the development work, uh, product development work on the pet insurance products for almost two years. Uh, well, we were founded back in 2016, and then you know about a year later, we started. Uh, the patent insurance development. But of course, at the time, throughout the entire development process, uh, COVID did not happen, right? So it is really right before the launch that you know, the COVID situation unfortunately had to break out. So, so uh, how flexible, how nimble are we really to address to the market situation become extremely important given the changing dyna dynamics going on. So uh, I think going back to what, what we discussed a little a bit earlier, uh, how do you make it a modular, uh, uh, product development uh, become really, really important, uh, whether from a pricing standpoint or, or, or from a you know, technology uh, standpoint, uh, well, both for the internal system and for user interface uh, side of thing. Uh, so I think that's, that's where we see. Okay. Do you guys uh, you know, look at a lot of data to help you guys to you know, like modify the user experience as you mentioned earlier, right? Yeah, so that's definitely the case. So there, are, well, we really uh, measure a lot of different things. We me measure uh, each step, each funnel, how much time does, does it take? What, what do people press the button? Like, you know, uh, where, do, where, where do they uh, face difficulty in assessing, in, in judging different things, right? So I think that's, that's one part. The second part is where the traffic is coming in. Like, what do they browse on other things? Right. So I think all those things give us the insights about what the customers are looking for. Uh, so, you know, so all those things are summing up uh, in how we decide uh, the priority of the new feature that we're going to put in. Uh, and ultimately, we want to improve the user experience and thus the conversion. Um, so we have uh, five minutes more. Um, I guess I'm going to wrap up with uh, one last question. So COVID-19 is actually giving a big hit to everyone. 
um, how do you see technology can help to, you know, like uplift the services level from, you know, what we have now? Um, so probably, you know, I will go with Kane first, um, you know, maybe name an area that you see that would be, you know, having the uh, quickest, you know, like modification or change that you, you foresee will be coming. Well, um, I think uh, I just uh, mentioned about this whole remote uh, boarding. I think this is going to be something that will continue to play out. Now, obviously, the, the, the bigger companies already invested in it. It's something that looks simple. Because I, I was talking to a major insurance company that they only had a team of three people. And I think they spent uh, something like two, two weeks and they somehow got, got it work. So it's, it's amazing. But then this can, this, the same cannot be said for the medium size to the smaller size uh, insurance players, including the IFAs. Because obviously the, those guys may not be as tax heavy uh, and also resource rich. So to me, I think the, the biggest traction to me, which I'm hopeful uh, in, in happening, is that with the help of an association like HM, HAFI, they can help to basically purchase you know, the related technology and they be able to push it out to the medium and small size insurance. And, and by having this, this is going to fast track the whole adoption of digitization. So it's something that it looks simple, but it's something is a very important first step. Cool. Uh, Fred, do you have any comments on this? Uh, yeah, I think that uh, principally is really what we are, the conditions that we are in now. Uh, it is, we are moving into a non-face-to-face -face environment. You call it digitalization, but uh, th this is necessary. So, so where uh, the, uh, a lot of uh, uh, companies are already moving into strategies to uh, you know, beef up their own digital, digital channels, right? So where EKYC now will continue to be relevant. But I, I think that maybe just to extend one, one more point would be that uh, this step is not only at enrollment stage, but the same client that now has already uh, purchased a first policy, he will come back to change data. He will come back to buy wealth. He will come back to, to do other stuff with you. And, and now using a uh, EKYC type, uh, approach to managing this person's identity will make him feel a lot more secure and safer as he interacts with this organization. That it is modern, right? It's secure, it's, 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 a, it's in pace with uh, what's happening because the worst thing is that you, you don't want to be, become irrelevant when, when the whole industry is moving in a certain direction. So, so I think that that, that is the, uh, uh, the comment I, I'll ask to leave with the team. Uh, Chiranth, any things that you would like to add on? Um, yeah, I think um, it, it's uh, just unprecedented times, right? Uh, we are, um, you know, in, in uh, we, uh, just to give an example of how everybody's struggling with this, uh, we had an insurer who came up with a COVID-19 specific product. Uh, there are multiple insurers and it has been mandated by, by the government as well. So most uh, health and general insurance companies are mandated to provide COVID-19 specific uh, um, products. Um, so uh, in the first few days of when this product launched, the pricing got revised uh, close to four times in a matter of 10 days, uh, which is unprecedented, right? It is unprecedented for any of us. So it just tells you that everybody, uh, everybody is sort of, this is attacking a lot of people in a, in a new, in new ways. Um, but uh, this is where the strength of underwriting comes in, right? So uh, we are uh, fortunate that we have worked with we have with some amazing insurance companies to power their products across distribution channels. Um, but uh, the, I think the fact of the matter is the, that these are uncharted waters, and uh, this, some of some of these things will take some time before they actually play out uh, in terms of uh, performance on balance sheets, uh, because there is no visibility of, uh, of of any of these of normalcy coming in uh, at least in the next sort of you know six to twelve months. So. Uh, that's where we are and that's what the industry is bracing ourselves for uh, here in markets like India. Good luck. Oh, yeah. uh, so Alvin, anything you would like to add on from a pet insurance coverage versus COVID-19? Yeah, well, I think the COVID-19 uh, is bringing a lot of um, a lot of mindset changes. Uh, I think mindset changes in the sense that, well, the e-commerce, the entire uh, mechanism, well, we talked to a lot of logistic company. I think all of them, like in the last six months time, uh, seeing almost doubling year on year type of growth. Uh, with insurance company, we have seen uh, a number of them who come wish us out 
And one of the comments I hear is that, uh, for example, for the claim uh, handlers, uh, they, are, well, they schedule the claim, claim handlers to go and wash their hands every two hours because they are taking the medical receipts and all those stuff, right? So I think there's a lot of mentality, the mindset changes. Um, there's a magic button like what, uh, what Kim was talking about early on. And with the regulator, I think they, they take a much more open-minded approach, what they call as a liberal interpretation uh, of the regulation. This is, uh, this is exactly the line that the insurance authority CEO is saying. So I think, you know, so there's a lot, but this is the perfect time really to think about how we can uplift the user experience together with all those uh, baggage, with all those legacy out of the place. Mm, okay, cool. Uh, last but not least, uh, Kevin, anything? Sure, I'll keep my answer pretty short. I think the biggest change that we're seeing and the quickest change we're seeing is in terms of digital customer interactions, uh, rapid voice bot slash chatbot implementations if they haven't done so already, uh, ID verification uh, digitally, and things that kind of facilitate the transaction of, of buying insurance policies, cl submitting claims and things of that nature. I think something that we're excited to see and, and we're, we'll see how it evolves with respect to innovation and startups that enter this space is that um, there's a changing tide from ensuring tangible to intangible assets. And as work becomes re more remote, um, insurers are going more to cloud services. There's uh, increasing gaps in cybersecurity or perhaps, perhaps even internet connectivity for business. Uh, these big risks that not all, a lot of start startups or even incumbents are handling right now. So I think uh, it's interesting for us to see like where are the, where are the gaps in, in, in coverage that will emerge post COVID-19 and how do startups adequately help insurance companies tackle those coverage gaps. I think that's quite interesting. Um, so um, I think time's up. Uh, so um, thanks everyone again. Um, I hope everyone will stay stay and healthy in this time. Uh, but last thing, last reminder is that there's actually a chat room um, in the uh, community chat uh, under the uh, lounge uh, area. So if you wanted to you know, network with us because please uh, join us there. Um, otherwise, thank you very much again and um, I hope that we'll see you soon. Thank you.